to wait till these guys. Okay. Welcome. Welcome. My name is Allison Druin, and I'm a professor in uh, the University of Maryland's College of Information Studies, otherwise known as Maryland's iSchool. Um, and together with Ira Chinoy, right here, uh, who is Associate Dean of the Philip Merrill College of Journalism at Maryland, we are the co-directors of the Future of Information Alliance. Welcome. Um, we want to welcome you especially to this amazing program on the big picture of big data. With the help of our distinguished futurists and panelists, we will be exploring the challenges and opportunities associated uh, with this term that we hear more and more about. We will learn about some of the surprising ways in which big data is being used, as well as why there's a growing perception that big data can play an increasingly vital role in our lives. So before we dive in, uh, we want to acknowledge the Robert W. Deutsch Foundation, which has been instrumental in making it possible for us to bring these great innovators and thinkers to Maryland. Uh, we want to thank uh, Jane Brown, Neil Diedrichson, and Mac McClure, if you would um, join me in thanking them. And uh, uh, Neil and Mac are here. Uh, they've also been instrumental in um, helping us create a seed grant program for um, our students and sort of forward-looking students and faculty mentors uh, <laughs> taking on some of the really big information challenges. Um, so this Future of Information Alliance is new to some of you. It got launched at the University of Maryland in 2011. And the idea was to find a way to have conversations that cut across disciplinary lines, you know, not the rigid silos of one discipline or another, but across lines to take on some of these big opportunities and challenges related to this evolving role of information in our lives. Um, and in addition to very broad support from our campus, from every one of the colleges and schools in our campus, we have 10 really terrific founding partners, uh, uh, most of whom have somebody here today. And they are um, the National Park Service, the Library of Congress, the National Geographic Society, the Smithsonian, the Museum, uh, Barry School, uh, Sesame Workshop, WAMU, and I'm sure that I missed one, National Archives, okay. uh, and could Library you, of Congress. If, if you you're here from them, one of those, would you please stand up? <laughs> and we also have some of the students from the winning seed grant teams. I'm wondering if you're just willing to stand up for a second. And uh, Students and faculty mentors, yeah, they did a great job. And of course, we want to give a special thanks to the Office of the Governor of Maryland for being our found, one of our founding partners in the Future of Information Alliance. Um, we need to give a big shout out to Zoe Pagonis, who's hiding over there. Uh, amazing. She is, she's represented quite amazingly the office of the governor in our alliance and has been the glue and so instrumental in making today's program happen. And so, Zoe, we thank you. Thank you. Um, and of course, we are grateful to Governor O'Malley and the state of Maryland for hosting today's program um, here in Annapolis. Um, and it uh, will shortly be our honor to introduce the governor, um, who will be here shortly. Um, <laughs> He has made the use of big data a signature element of his administration, first as mayor of Baltimore and now uh, here as governor of Maryland. Um, but before you hear from the governor, we're going to ask Pat O'Shea, our uh, fearless vice president for research at the University of Maryland, to uh, make some opening remarks. Pat, thank you. Thank you, and I really want to thank uh, the governor and his staff uh, for hosting us here today in the, in the, in the Senate, uh, the Miller Senate building. Um, the governor has done great things for the state of Maryland, for the University of Maryland, 
for the Future of Information Alliance, and he truly has a wonderful understanding of the importance of big data for all people. I want to thank the Deutsch Foundation again, Neil, Mac, and Taylor, without whose support this would not have been possible. Thank you. <laughs> and our fearless leaders, Aaron Allison, whose conception all of this uh, thing is. So I've um, got a question for everybody here. So what were you doing 20 years ago this week? Anybody remember first week, second week of May 1993, what was going on in big data? <laughs> well, I remember what I was doing. Um, I was sitting, I was an accelerator physicist back then, and I was sitting in my office in Los Alamos, New Mexico. And I was fooling around with my new friend, Veronica. And in College Park, Maryland, just up the road from here, there was a young man who was preparing for his graduation. And he was also very interested in Veronica. So what was going on? There was music in the cafes at night and revolution in the air. And the revolution was a big uh, data revolution because a few days before, a group of physicists at the European Center for, for Nuclear Phys Physics put out this memo saying that they were making open source the software for the World Wide Web. That was the beginning of the really big uh, data revolution. Prior to that, it was just a bunch of physicists who were trying to transfer big data between Los Alamos and CERN and Maryland and Stanford and stuff like that. But it was the first week of um, May, 20 years ago, where things really began to explode. The first browser had just been released uh, a few months before. And of course, Veronica was a grandmother of all search because Veronica stands for Very Easy Rodent-Oriented Netwide Index to Computer Archives. And that connects to Gopher, but I'm not going to go into to all of that. And so that student at Maryland, Sergey Brin, left and headed out and within a couple of years had founded your company, Google. So, you know, Veronica begat Sergey begat uh, Google. And so things were all getting started. Uh, so I guess, you know, Sergey was the grandfather and Veronica was the grandmother. Uh, and things were really getting started this week um, uh, 20 years ago. And it was started because this group of accelerator physicists wanted to ship or wanted to collect, you know, control and analyze uh, big data uh, but they began to realize that this was important to all people, that all people have access to these uh, methodologies that they have uncovered. And so this was really, really the beginning of, of what we've seen burgeoning over the past uh, 20 years. So I'm, I'm the vice president and chief research officer of the university, and so I oversee a diverse enterprise of knowledge creation. And as a research university, it is our duty not just to disseminate knowledge, but to create it and to apply it uh, for the, the good of all people. And, and big data is the perfect example of the kind of thing we should be working on because it represents great opportunities and uh, great uh, challenges as we go forward. I mean, there are all sorts of opportunities that we hear about in the news, about how by analyzing Google searches, you can uncover drug interactions before they would even show up in, in, in clinical trials, or you can you know, analyze the spread of influenza, or how to buy a good airline ticket, or how to determine your shoe size based on your Twitter feed analysis. Uh, you know, I mean, there's all sorts of ways you can find metaphorical needles in, in, a hyper, in a cyber haystack. I mean, one of my particular interest is predicting the weather, because how can we have any credibility in predicting climate change 20 years from now if we can't even predict today's weather? Because my son was supposed to be running a track meet just up the road today, and it was canceled yesterday because he said it was going to be absolutely pouring rain, and I think the sun is still shining. And you may remember, anybody remember what happened on March 6th this year? I was supposed to be at an event in Baltimore that the governor was supposed to be at, and it was canceled because that was snow quest. Remember that we shut down everything because we're going to have snow? Well, the American weather prediction predicted snow. The European weather prediction, which I followed, said it was going to be rain. And that's a big data problem that if you're going to make predictions about the weather, you better gather the right data, control it, and analyze it perfectly because it can have huge economic impacts locally and uh, globally. So you know, big data can have enormous benefits. 
However, it can also pose enormous threats as it can be manipulated by manipulative users, uh, destructive organizations, and uh, oppressive governments. So the opportunities and the challenges are not just interdisciplinary, they're not multidisciplinary, they're what I call transdisciplinary because they must be addressed not just by the science and technology side of the house, but people involved in privacy, business, ethics, economics, economics policy, psychology, and law have to get involved in these things. So the humanities, the arts, the sciences, and everything has to work together. And so therefore, the future of information and big data are ripe for attack by the comprehensive forces that can only be brought to bear by leading at globally engaged research universities, such as the University of Maryland and its partners that are represented uh, here today. So uh, we are, are committed to being uh, global leaders in the future of information and big data. And we will have fearless ideas that will transform our students and we will transform the world as we go forward. So I see the governor isn't here yet, so I'm gonna move on to the <laughs> next step, right. which is to introduce my, my good friend, Dan Russell. So he is Google's director of user happiness. So that, I guess, makes him the Dalai Lama of the internet. <laughs> Did, now, <laughs> he's, really actually, he's really actually an anthropologist, a search anthropologist. So he studies how you do your search and then takes that information and brings it back to Google to provide a, a better service and a better, better um, uh, you know, a product and so forth. And also he teaches people how to be better users of, of search and the internet and so forth. And so he's, uh, in addition to his appointment at Google, he is also a visiting futurist at the University of Maryland. And he comes here regularly. I mean, we see him several times a year, and he's not just flying in and flying out. He's here for several days. So he really connects with us and connects us to the outside world. It's, it's really important for our students and faculty to meet him. And so, you know, several of us actually met the real Dalai Lama yesterday, so we're going to be watching your Zen here to see if you project the same level as the real Dalai Lama. I'll do so, what I can. Do what you can. Yeah, just, just be relaxed. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, sir. Um, like you, I remember Archie and Veronica and Gopher and wide area information system and all those archaic systems back in the past. And I remember when I, it was a little bit before 93, when I first used the World Wide Web and it ran on a VT100 terminal. Anyone remember those? Yep. Okay. Yep. Wow, we are in the aged home. <laughs> But it was, a, I remember seeing it and as a computer scientist at that time at the University of Rochester, I remember looking at it and thinking, this guy has saved, made so many mistakes, there's no way this will work. Which is why I'm now a futurist. <laughs> I was on the panel that rejected Tim Berners-Lee for his paper to the Hypertext Conference. <laughs> and, and we made it up later in Edinburgh we, when he became the keynote speaker. Um, so we learn from the past, uh, and I've been involved in things like this. How do people make sense of large amounts of information? How do they look for stuff, as Pat said? And it, this has been an intriguing question for me for, for a long time now. And so one of the great things about being associated with the Future for Information Alliance is it allows me to work with a really interesting ensemble of people, people who are practitioners in the art of communication, people who are experienced about writing, and getting complex ideas across. This is an interesting crucible where ideas can meld together, and I'm really happy to be a part of it. So my position now, as you just heard, is I work closely with the search group. So when you do a search on Google, there's a little piece of my, my intellect in there somewhere, tiny, vanishingly small piece of it. <laughs> but what I do is I'm actually kind of the person who <coughs> bridges the gaps between cognitive psychology, software engineering, anthropology, teaching, the whole nine yards, which makes me either a renaissance man or a dilettante. <laughs> a little of both, I hope, uh, for sake of my ego. Um, but at any rate, what this allows me to do is to come to places like this and try to draw on all the mistakes of my past and look forward to how the future of information will progress. So today we have 
what I think is a mar actually a marvelous panel. And so what I'd like to do is introduce my fellow panelists, and then I'm going to give a little pitch about uh, the way I think big data is going. Let me begin first with um, our first speaker after me will be Victor Meyer Schoenberger. He's the professor of internet governance and regulation at Oxford. Earlier, he spent 10 years on the faculty of Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Professor Meyer Schoenberger has published 10 books and more than 100 articles and book chapters. His most recent books are the best-selling Big Data, A Revolution That Will Transform How We Live, Work, and Think, which he co-authored with Ken Kukie, and the award-winning Delete, The Virtue of Forgetting in the Digital Age. Please join me in welcoming Victor. <laughs> Next in our panel, we have Brian Sivak, who is the chi Chief Technology Officer at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, where he's also the entrepreneur in residence. He may be known to some of you here as Maryland's former Chief Innovation Officer. And before that, his resume includes being Chief Technology Officer for the District of Columbia. His earlier work in the private sector included development of a pioneering natural language search engine that was available on the web way back in 1998. Please join me in welcoming Brian. After we hear from our visiting futurists, we'll also get some responses from Jen Goldbeck on the end here, director of the University of Maryland's Interdisciplinary Human Computer Interaction Lab and an associate professor in the iSchool, the university's College of Information Studies. Like Victor, he, she has a new book out too. This one's entitled Analyzing the Social Web. She will respond to presenters with her own set of observations and questions. Please join me in welcoming Jen. Okay, so then after each of the presenters gets a chance to talk for a little bit, Jen will interrogate us with some penetrating questions of her own, and then we'll open up to the audience and to people who are connected virtually but not co-present with us, okay? So I'm gonna start off with a little talk of my own. Now, as a, a person who works at Google, I live, swim, breathe, eat big data. It's my job. So a big part of what I wanna get across in the next few minutes is a sense of what it's like to live in such an environment and the common, some of the things I've learned. So the first thing I want to talk about is, so what's big data? You've heard this buzzword before. And to first order, it's data bigger than anything you had five years ago. <laughs> now, I kind of mean that seriously, because now I can go to my local electronics store and buy a terabyte drive for 100 bucks. I would have killed for a couple megabytes when I was a beginning computer science student. But more seriously, I think big data is actually about a qualitative shift in the way we think about, process, consume, use, understand large quantities of data. So for example, it's not just streams of numbers and characters coming into you. It's actually things like this. Now, there are two big drivers about big data. A, the price of memory has dropped through the floor. Memory will never be it free, but it might be infinite or effectively infinite. And if you look at this chart, all known forms of memory have dropped very, very rapidly over the past decade. This is a log chart. If I gave it to you in a linear form, it would be much worse, or much more impressive, depending on your point of view. The other thing that's happened is that in addition to all the memory devices we have, we've had a radical uptick in the number of data sources, places that are popping out information. We have things like the social media, we have websites, we have quantified self-movements, we have all manner of things. For example, medical data alone is a tremendous driver in the amount of big data that's coming into our systems. We also have movements like the quantified self. This is how people are actually starting to track their personal performance, trying to understand themselves, and in the context of a few million other people, how they behave. We also have things like government data, for example, the traffic flow over different bridges, which you can track moment by moment traffic flow as being monitored by cell phones moving throughout the environment. The next big thing I want to mention to you is what I call datification. This is a term that actually talks about how do you look at a big quantity of data, which is nominally actually at the bottom just numbers. But the truth is I can't deal with big numbers. What I can deal with is are extracted properties of that data set. Here's work by Sepp Kamvar and Jonathan Harris, which is mining the Twitterverse, and it's mining it for affect, 
That is, they've written some code that actually pulls out how people are feeling at any one moment. And aggregating that data in en masse so that you can find things like, when it rains, people are sad. That's not surprising. But what is surprising is how people then respond to sad people who are in rainy conditions. It's a fascinating piece of work. There's also things that you might not have thought about a priori. For example, Google Earth is classic big data. We have pictures of every spot on the planet. You can get to it from your phone sitting here. Now, one of the things that's interesting about it is you can then post hoc go through, like this paper describes, and discover features in that planetary image set. For example, what's vegetation, what's roads, and so on. With Google data sets, you can also, for example, as these folks did um, at the reported on the National Academy of Sciences, the orientation of cows in open fields. It might surprise you to know that most of them are actually aligned more or less north-south. We did not code that in the data. It was extracted, it was datafied out of the original source information. Third big point, big data is becoming much, much simpler to use. Now, that's sort of evident as we all see web uh, dashboards and so on. But it's an important thing to think about because truth is, most of us will not deal with big data. That's the reality of it. But you will deal with the implications of it. You will deal with the visualizations of it. One of the easiest ones I like to talk about is the Google Ngram viewer. This is where we've taken all of the text out of all the English books that we've scanned in Google Books and allowed you to do quick and dirty analysis of that data. So here I've plotted uh, the occurrence of Albert Einstein, Sherlock Holmes, and Frankenstein on a plot. And you can see that the, the, the Frankenstein term appears in, starting about 1880 when she wrote that book. And it still dominates over legitimate science even today. <laughs> you can also do things in a more a political vein like this where we have uh, precinct level data that's aggregated and viewed through the agency of a web service. So this was done by the Palm Beach Post. It allows you to drill down in the voting patterns and population shifts in Florida easily. This is easy on your desktop. They just do it as a service, as part of their reportage. Fourth big point. Big data has a distinct, there's a kind of two sides of the coin here. There's the use of it, which is now, as we see, becoming easier. Then there's the back end architecture. <laughs> Gratefully, most of us won't have to think about this part, but let me give you a quick illustration of this. One of the things you have to do if you're going to actually deal with a couple of petabytes of data is actually parallelize that data. So one of the architectural implications for big data is you can't handle it in a serial fashion on your laptop. Sorry, when you get to the exabyte size, it doesn't work anymore. What we do instead is we start to take all this data that's stored in disk somewhere or memory somewhere, and we map it out into these individual processes here. We then shuffle, we shard it out so we can do all this stuff in parallel. This is a key idea. You cannot process this code serially. You cannot process this data serially. Now, one of the implications of having all this stuff is that big data now asks more of us, actually asks more of the analyst, because all of a sudden, you could actually comprehend that Excel spreadsheet. You might still make mistakes, but you could sort of understand, say, what a thousand rows of data are trying to tell you. But what does 20 million rows of data try to tell you? Some of our experiments we run, we get 20 million rows of data a day. We run an experiment for two weeks, you do the math. You cannot understand that without having some notion of what that data is trying to tell you. So it's not just a matter of getting the data into a table, you have to then clean it, you have to organize it, and then the critical step, you have to analyze it and tell a story with it. It all comes back to telling a story. So big data also requires informacy, or sort of information understanding on the part of you, the consumer, us, the users. And understanding, for example, what's being collected and how. There are often inherent biases in these things, or the datafication instills a certain kind of slant or a certain kind of uh, spin on the data. We need to understand all of that and what we can do about it. You need, for example, to be able to understand how to read in a new way. You can probably see some of these charts and maybe you recognize them, maybe you know how to interpret them. But what's happening in the age of visualization, which is consequent to the appearance of big data, the age of visualization requires that we have new ways of reading, new ways of understanding how to read these diagrams. This is what informacy in big data is all about. 
Another big point here is that when we have large data, we can drop the illusion that our data is perfect. We no longer have to live with this sort of false sense that if I've got 25 rows of 20 columns each, those, each data point is precious. Each data point is a crystalline jewel of exact information. The truth is, we've always lived with uncertainty in our data collection. <clears throat> now we have to understand what that's all about and what it means. So as I said, visualization is becoming essentially a new language, a new form for us to understand. So we can build visualizations like this, which allow you to look at thousands of processors and how they're functioning all at once. Google has the thing called the Google Globe Explorer, simple API so that you can build stuff and visualize your data set, your worldwide data set, with simple, couple of simple API calls. We have the ability to take multiple data sets and integrate them and merge them together. Or, as you can see in the work of Aaron Koblen, who's a, a data scientist at Google, the ability to look at many, many flights crossing the United States. You can look at them under different kinds of conditions, and you can zoom in, in this case, to San Francisco to see what's really going on. Big data, as you saw in that example, is not just giant data sets that are created and static. They're streaming data. So in my class, which had 300,000 people in it in June, we could actually look in and see exactly what was going on in each instant. So big point I want to give you here is that big data, just because we put it out there, is not the same as knowledge. It's not the same as telling a story. So big data is not the same as sunlight. We have to remember this for the people who are using our data sets. I also want to leave you with a thought here. One of the exciting things about big data for me is that we live in a new age, the age when we actually can look at all of this stuff and start to make some sense out of it. Here I'm showing you a chart of Google Trends uh, over time. And I'm showing you football, baseball, and basketball. And it's clear the giant peaks over there are the ravens. <laughs> So you got to understand that you can look at the worldwide query set and start to extract deeper meaning. And I'll leave you with this one thought. When we apply that same technology that you saw showing how football relates to basketball, you can also start to look at the trend queries that are indicating the presence of flu state by state, region by region, worldwide. This is a phenomenal, phenomenal kind of effect of big data. I'm going to leave you with that. Thank you very much. Uh, Allison? Am I on? I think you're on. I think that you're this, the floor is yours. Hi, how are you doing, man? Nice to meet you. Good to see How's you. How's it going, Dan? Yeah, come on. Dan, thanks very much. Hello, everyone. You having fun today? Well, I look forward to being able to connect with you and, and talk a little more informally and hopefully steal good ideas from you over a beer at the governor's house um, immediately following this program, right? All are invited. So it's good to see you. We miss you terribly. <laughs> Zoe has gone on to the Democratic National Committee. She was our ace, you know, rock star social media person. Brian Civic was our... Uh, first uh, chief uh, innovation officer, and he's gone on to the Obama administration, right? <coughs> Tom Perez was our labor commissioner. Now he's up for labor commissioner. John Picari was our secretary of transportation. Now he's the deputy secretary of transportation. Hmm. So I regret I have but one cabinet to give to my country. <laughs> <coughs> But we give and we give and we give. <laughs> so it's wonderful to see all of you. You're from all over the East Coast, all over the country. Dan, thank you for your presentation. And also, uh, uh, Sergey is a, a Maryland graduate, yes? yes? Yes. We'd like to name a campus after him. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell him that. So please, please let him know. I'd love to catch up with him sometime. <laughs> as a Maryland grad who will soon be looking for employment. Um, so let me thank uh, Vice President Pat O'Shea, the University of Maryland, and um, uh, also Neil Nidrickson and Mac McClure of the Deutsche Foundation. And uh, I've been asked just to talk a little bit about big data and give you the perspective of a, a practitioner and the one generalist in the family. I'm, I'm the one person that's supposed to know a little something about everything, but not too much about anything. Uh, therefore, my remarks will probably more, be more truncated than others. Um, 
But let me, let me just share with you some ideas and just some quick thoughts as you go on to the next piece of your program. And, and again, I do look forward to, to meeting with you and, and seeing you across the, uh, across the way at, at, uh, later on. Uh, big data. The big data, I think, is forever changing the way we manage that common platform of ours called our government in all aspects. Um, in states like Maryland, it's uh, changing the way we govern. It's helping us to make better choices so we can achieve better results. And just to uh, rattle off a few of them, uh, we had never had the distinction before, but now for five years in a row have been named the number one public schools in America for five years in a row. Uh, thank you. We have driven violent crime down to 30-year lows, and it's not because you know, we were immune from the recession or the job losses or the foreclosures. We've gone through a lot of pain here ourselves, but we've become a lot smarter at how we, we manage and, and how we deploy to where the problems and or the opportunities are. And we have been named now, as of just last week, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, hardly a mouthpiece for the Maryland Democratic Party, uh, named the state of Maryland the number one state in America for the second year in a row for innovation and entrepreneurship. We have more PhDs per capita than any other state in the union, and we also have the highest median income of any state in the union, and in the first quarter of this year had the fourth fastest rate of new job creation of any state in the union, and most of those jobs are coming from emerging, emerging sectors like life science, biotech, IT, cyber, space, aerospace. So uh, there's a lot of really good things happening here, and they're not happening by themselves. They're happening because we're making better choices, and therefore we're achieving better results. And big data has been a big part of this ever since I stumbled onto a great idea that I saw in motion up in New York uh, when uh, Bill Bratton and Jack Maple, who Elliot Schlanger, our first head of uh, IT in the city of Baltimore and now our chief information officer in the state will attest, uh, Jack Maple was our first consultant to our police department in Baltimore when I was elected in 1999 after having pointed to New York for four years as a councilman saying, if they can do it, why can't we do it? If they can do the computer pin mapping, put the cops on the dots, run plays, use the data of where crime's happening and what hours and, and the deployment to solve crimes, anticipate crimes, uh, why can't we do it? And so we did. And Jack's uh, goal, when he came and took us on as his very last project, was um, one of the things that made it attractive for him, as he fought a uh, uh, terminal diagnosis of uh, colon cancer at the time, was that I very much believed that this idea of big data and this idea of managing according to a common platform, data-informed uh, and performance-driven, could be done not only in a police department, could, but should and could be done citywide throughout the entire enterprise. And, and that's what we did, setting public goals, relentlessly measuring performance on a weekly basis, broadly sharing information rather than hoarding it, and putting it on the internet for all to see. And I will confess to you that uh, this has been much more of a, uh, a journey and an evolution than it has any sort of, than it has been any sort of arrival. But every week we're, we're a little better than we were the week before. Better not only at delivering the results, um, and, and better not only at analyzing the data, but also better at putting it forward in a public, with a public face so that citizens who are very busy doing all of the other essential things that we need for them to be doing as parents and as you know, uh, wage earners and as uh, uh, leaders of their own families and households so that they can look at this information in a dashboard fashion if they want and know whether or not their government's uh, any better, know, knowing where... Um, uh, whether or not they're, uh, uh, you know, whether they're, we're achieving the results that we want together. Uh, we open source and we publicly identify our problems. We crowdsource the solutions. And um, again, we make it available to all. One of the stories I'm fond of, of retelling, which and I'll give you the short version here, is that whenever I would give a um, presentation on city stat up in the city stat room in the city of Baltimore, and by the way, we now do state stat, and we do this across the enterprise and state government. So cleaning up the Chesapeake Bay, um, uh, improving the skills of our people, the sustainability of our way of life, the security of our people. 
But when I w used to show community, uh, when the neighborhood leaders would come in, I'd start whipping through the slides, showing them the data, showing them the maps and how we're able to collate it and do the layers and all of those things. And after about 10 minutes, there was always someone in the crowd, regardless of whether it was uh, they were a crowd uh, predominantly white or black or, or rich or poor. Someone would raise their hand within five minutes and say, can you show me my house? <laughs> can you show me my house? Big data gives us the tools to deploy our resources where the opportunities lie. And um, it also, I believe, has the capacity and the, um, the power to reinvigorate our democracy this garden that we must do a better job of tending if we expect it to grow and if we expect uh, uh, our republic to uh, send its roots deeper in terms of our understanding, our compassion, and where our house uh, fits uh, in, uh, in this uh, common dashboard of ours. So we've created a number of common platforms. Bill Bratton had a saying in his latest book, Collaborate or Perish, um, he said that people make, it, uh, people make it happen, but common platforms make it possible. So common platforms for the big data and public safety that we call the public safety dashboard. You want to find a, a, a test case of people that are reluctant to use new technology or log on? I mean, if you take this to Google, if you want to really break the code of people that are cynical, don't embrace technology, and are reluctant to go online and search for anything, Get a group of police officers. <laughs> Drug dealers take the technology like that. <laughs> they really do. Police officers, you have to drag them to it. But now thousands and thousands of police officers, detectives in every department in our state use the public safety dashboard because it's like Google for public safety. It, cr it combines all of those, um, uh, all of those um, streams of information. Uh, we use uh, the workforce dashboard, and a lot of these tools we've been working on, Elliot, since we walked in. I mean, this is not easy stuff. There are very few places where it's been done before or done well. So uh, the workforce dashboard, a common dashboard so that we can see where the demand for skills is, where the training is, where the delta of opportunity is that needs to be crossed in order to fill those jobs that are open and that are here if only our people had the skills to fill them. Uh, uh, Josh uh, Sharfstein is here, the head of uh, our Secretary of Health, and we are a leader in implementing not only the Affordable Care Act, but also health IT, so that we can have a public, or rather, so that we can have a common dashboard for uh, public health, so that we can see where the concentrations, as they've done in Camden, we can see where the concentrations of kids who are chronically absent because of asthma, uh, people that are readmitted to hospitals because of congestive heart failure or diabetes, and be able to deploy our upstream interventions and assets in terms of prevention, wellness, nutrition, and all of those things. Uh, I mentioned the Bay. BayStat is our common platform for reducing the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus and sediment that is being force-fed by human design choices on the land. And, uh, and, and being able to uh, measure our progress and our actions to goal. So GIS, smart maps, dashboards, uh, big data, all of these tools are really things that have only uh, 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 come into our use in a, in a flash of human history. I mean, when I think, when I was first elected mayor, 90% of our requests for, from citizens, trash in the alley or those sorts of things, came in by mail. Now 98% of them come in electronically, even in a, in a poor, relatively you know, modest uh, city. So ultimately, uh, all of this comes down to uh, our own will and our own intentions and our willingness to embrace change and br embrace the power of uh, open source data. Um, you know, you're all part of, uh, there's a, a different sort of leadership that's, that we now expect, and especially younger people expect. Um, our parents, I suppose, became used to a sort of leadership that had information a month ahead of everybody else. So leaders had that situational advantage. And um, in the absence of the internet, effective leaders were primarily ideological. Their organizations were hierarchical. And their methods were bureaucratic. 
in the information age, a different sort of leadership is required in order, uh, in order for us to, in, uh, you know, in order to be effective. And that leadership, instead of being ideological, needs to be primarily and fundamentally entrepreneurial. What works? And show me it works. When people have their information as quickly as the leader, it also needs to be uh, a, a style of leadership that is, that is collaborative, that is far more flat, if you will, in its orientation than hierarchical. And it, in its methods, rather than being bureaucratic, it needs to be based on common platforms, performance measured, data driven, and relentlessly interactive. Big data is really important, and it is a, a big shift. Um, but the common platforms that make it possible, the people that make it happen, people that are united by their belief in the dignity of every individual, by an understanding that we're all in this together, and people that are also committed to advancing through their own individual actions and choices the common good. And the hope of big data, ultimately, is really big action, isn't it? Life-saving action. The sort of action and choices that can save a city. The sort of actions and choices that can save a planet. And I'm looking forward to seeing you all later on tonight so that we can do all of these things together. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks a lot. We'll see you. See you later. There's your cooker right there. Oh, that is a hard act to follow. <laughs> One second, you'll be ready. I, uh, I used to be slotted in the graveyard uh, shift right after lunch at presentations uh, on a Friday afternoon. And so when I heard that I am actually uh, speaking here in the middle of the, uh, of the event, I was saying, yes, no graveyard shift for once. <laughs> Graveyard shift. <laughs> Here we go. When um, Allison and Ira came to me and said, please uh, uh, join us in having a conversation about big data, um, they also told me that Dan would be here, and I had to follow Dan. <laughs> I don't know what's worse, you know, following the governor or following Dan. And so they said, don't talk about big data and what it is and so forth and how wonderful it is, because Dan has already done that and much better than you can. <laughs> so so rather, than, rather than doing that, they said, we'll give you an easier task. As you wrote your book about big data, surely you must have had some surprises along the way. So give us, tell us four surprises that you had. And so, you know, to be honest with you, I had lots of surprises, but I, I selected four of them. So let's look at big data and big surprises, and it's perfectly subjective. <laughs> There's no big data there. So the first surprise for me with respect to big data was the surprising sectors that are affected and changed and revolutionized by big data. You would think, if you think about big data, about uh, electronic commerce, online retailing. Think about Amazon, right? Amazon, with its ability to crunch a lot of data, is able to predict and make good book recommendations and predict what kind of books you're interested in buying. They're so successful in doing that that they had to change their business model in the 1990s. I still remember the early days of Amazon they had on their staff dozens of high, highly paid book reviewers that would be writing book reviews. And people would read these book reviews in the hope that you know, uh, they would like a book and, uh, and buy it. Then Amazon tried an algorithm based on big data. And they did an A-B test between the book reviewers, the human beings, and the algorithm. The algorithm won hands down. Today, the algorithm, the recommendation engine that drives Amazon's recommendations, apparently is uh, 
responsible for about 30% of the total Amazon revenues. So it's huge. But, but that's not the sectors that I want to talk about. I want to talk about something completely different. Think about premature babies. Premature babies are incredibly vulnerable, vulnerable to infections. And what you need to know is when an infection is there at a baby and early on so that you can fight it. Otherwise, you lose the fight. Dr. Carolyn McGregor at the university in, in Canada at the university hospital there is studying premature babies using big data. What she's doing is she's collecting 16 real-time vital signs, collecting 1,000 data points a second from a premature baby. And she's collecting that for each of the premature babies that she has in her group and over hours and days. Now, doing big data analysis, she is able to predict the likely onset of an infection 24 hours before the first symptoms manifest themselves. That gives doctors tremendously useful time to save the baby. Intriguingly, the telltale sign of a likely infection 24 hours later is not that the vital signs go haywire, but that they stabilize. What physician would have thought about that? You know, when the vital signs stabilize, you think you can go home for the night. Instead, the baby is in for a rough night ahead. That's the power of big data. Big data saves lives. The second one, the second sector that is in for a tremendous change is education. Education is a small data at best sector with lots of human hunches in it. But think about it, what we can do today with electronic books and textbooks uh, being put on electronic platforms like the Kindle or the Nook or uh, the, the iPad. When big data came out, I got onto uh, Amazon's Author Central, and Amazon now tells me what paragraphs, what sentences people underline in my book most frequently. I now have feedback from my readers that I would never had before. With textbooks and education, we now have the ability using big data platforms and applications to finally find out what books work and what don't, and not just rely on preferences and hunches uh, of a small number of people who make the decisions. Thirdly, uh, the third sector that I was surprised to find that big data has a huge impact is in urban planning. There is a company in the state of Washington called Inrix. You might have heard of Inrix. What Inrix does, it creates, it produces an app on smartphones that helps you with a turn-by-turn navigation from A to B, basically helping you in your commute. But it also gives you real-time traffic information, routing you around uh, traffic jams. Now, how does Inrix gather that data? Every one of the application is also a sensor application. And you, when you are driving with the help of Inrix from A to B, become a sensor for Inrix, sending data back about how fast you're going, when and where. That way, Inrix has 100 million data points. And they know that the value of the data is not exhausted by using it for the primary purpose it was collected, but for secondary purposes that it can be put to use. So in the United Kingdom, Local governments, as well as urban planners, use INRIX data to model in real time the traffic flows of commuters in and out of London. And they found out that there are many more computers from outside villages and hamlets that they never thought would have been on the commuter line. Random sampling didn't reveal that. But if you can get comprehensive data sets approaching n equals all, as the statisticians tell us, then you can get that. 
Which leads me to a second surprise that I had, namely that we have surprising data available. Dan already said it so beautifully. Datafication is happening. Namely, the rendering of more and more aspects of reality into data form that then can be analyzed and interpreted using big data. He mentioned the Google Ngram viewer coming out of the Google Books project. Uh, and he showed you uh, an, an example about Frankenstein uh, and, and others. I'm showing you a similar project of the digital humanities, but which a much more sobering kind of subtext to it. What you see here is something akin to an engram view. You see the use of uh, the word Marc Chagall, which is a famous painter, in publications in literature in 20th century, in German and in English. And what you see is that during the Nazi era, it just drops. The mentioning of Marc Chagall in German literature just drops. What you see here is the fingerprint of censorship. Not qualitatively, quantitatively. Or take this. This is an example of, from the United Kingdom where uh, general practitioners, doctors out there, were prescribing statins, uh, a medication for a relatively benign medical condition. But some of them were prescribing uh, the generic form, and some of them were prescribing a much more expensive proprietary form of the medication. By mining public data from the National Health Service, uh, data analysts were able to point out which areas in Britain were particularly prone to wasteful spending using proprietary statins rather than generic ones. It's new data. It's data that we didn't know that we had before, and we can extract some value for it. My third point, my third surprise, was about winners and losers, surprising ones of them. You would imagine that with big data and everything being big, bigger is naturally better. With big data, that's not necessarily the case. Scale doesn't mean success. If you're bigger in big data, you're not necessarily successful. Google is successful not only because they're big, but because they're smart. <laughs> so bigger is not necessarily better. In fact, big data gives us an opportunity to, to be extremely successful on the, on the other end of the entrepreneurial spectrum with very small companies. Two quick examples. Um, and, and, and this works because of commodification of processing and storage and cloud uh, services and so forth. One example is a company called Decide.com. Has anybody of you used Decide.com? It's a great company. You can look for consumer products like cameras and so forth, and it will tell you, it will predict whether the price is going up and down in the next week or two. And so confident are they in their prediction that they will pay the price difference if they're wrong. And they have hundreds of thousands of users, hundreds of thousands of them. And every one of them has the opportunity to save a bundle, one way or the other, either by buying at the right moment or by, if the prediction was wrong, getting the money back. Now, the site.com works with billions of price points. They have 30 employees and not a single server. It's all in the cloud. You don't need scale for success. The second point about winners and losers is what is the role of society? What is the role of government? In the 1990s and into the first decade of the 21st century, we, we thought that infrastructure, getting the pipe, the data pipe to people, was the most important issue was the most important challenge, was the most important problem that needed to be solved. To an extent, it still is, but to a much larger extent, we have solved the problem. But if data is the new gold of the future, then it's not just about the plumbing anymore. 
data itself becomes infrastructure rather than just the cables. And so we need to think what the role of government is to provide infrastructure and to provide data. Because the future of, the, of, of, of our society is not by paving more roads or by creating um, more electricity grids, also we might need some of them, but by creating an infrastructure of information, of data that people can use. And let me, before I conclude, come to the fourth surprise, namely the surprising dark side of things, dark side of big data. When I went into writing the book, my hunch was having done 20 years of data protection work and privacy work, that the biggest challenge of big data uh, was privacy. That may be true, but, but that's a, a, a thinking that comes out of, of the small data age. Uh, now there's a new dark side emerging. And that new dark side is that algorithms predict human behavior. And they will punish us not for how we have behaved, but how we, how we are predicted we will behave. Now, isn't that great in a way? That we can predict something before it's happening and then therefore the crime doesn't take place? Isn't that perfect? Isn't prevention much better than punishment? Not so fast. Um, for once, any prediction is never perfect. So that means that we will punish people without them being responsible and without certainty. Worse, that by punishing people, before they have acted, we essentially deny them human free will, volition. We're not letting fate play out, and therefore, we don't give them the opportunity to not act and to stay within the law. That's worrying. That's troubling, deeply troubling. But let's make sure we understand this. The culprit here is not big data. The culprit here is the abuse, the misuse of big data, how it is being used. Because we cannot use big data correlations that only tell us what, that don't tell us why things are happening in order to make causal decisions and punish individuals. If we do that, we are on a slippery slope per with a dictatorial society. But it is tempting because we human beings are hardwired to see the world as a series of causes and effects. If you fall sick after you've eaten at a new restaurant, you blame the restaurant even though it is much more likely that you got the stomach bug by shaking hands with your colleague. Human beings have this tendency to see causes even where they don't exist. And so what we must make sure is that we don't go down that slippery slope of abusing big data for purposes that it can't be used. Thanks very much. All right, uh, that was uh, <clears throat> that was excellent. Um, you know, it's uh, it's it's great to be back here. I uh, as the introductions went, uh, I was the chief innovation officer for the state uh, before my current role as the chief technology officer and entrepreneur in residence at the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, in DC, and um, the um, you know one of the interesting things about uh, health data and health care is that the world is so massive and complex. And as both Dan and Victor uh, touched on, uh, th it's a rich uh, vein to mine for some of the stuff that uh, these guys are trying to do. And so uh, Dan and Victor have kind of taken us through a uh, overview in a sort of general sense of the big data topic. I'm going to go a little bit deep in uh, the idea of big data or data being utilized in the healthcare space. So one of the things that I've come to learn uh, over the past 10 months or so is that data is 
actually fundamental in transforming our healthcare system. And uh, as many of you guys probably know, uh, we spend $2.8 trillion a year in this country on healthcare. Uh, that amounts to about 18% uh, of our GDP, which is larger than the GDP of France. Uh, and it turns out that one of the uh, key components to actually fixing that from a policy perspective is the data that is generated by the system. Um, and, and the idea really there is to figure out how we change from moving from a transactional system, one where doctors fix you when you're sick, to a value-based system where doctors actually are paid to keep you out of the hospital and keep you well. Um, another way that data is used and useful in this system, though, is in terms of how your health is maintained and how care is delivered. Uh, and one of the things that really fascinates me as kind of a data geek is how um, all of this personal and clinical data that's getting generated today uh, is going to reshape health and healthcare in this country. And so I could talk for hours about that first one, and it's a little wonky, and people like Josh Sharfstein sitting in the back could probably do a much better job than I could, so I'll leave that to him. Uh, but today I want to focus on really the second piece, this, this idea of maintenance of health, of getting people personally invested in their own uh, healthcare uh, has a way, uh, uh, the potential to fundamentally reshape the system. Um, and so I want to start by talking about what's available today, and uh, really what I want to talk about is me. <laughs> this, <laughs> you'll see. So what you're looking at here uh, is a graph of my weight from literally uh, the middle of 2010 through pretty much today, so the la last three years or so, three and a half years, three years. Um, Weight is a chaotic system, right? So you can't look at any individual data point on weight and say, oh, I'm going up or down on a given day. That's a good thing or a bad thing. But you can look at trends over time. And what's interesting to me about this graph is that you'll notice three sort of major inflection points, right? The first one, you'll notice that I was at sort of a plateau for a while, and then all of a sudden I hit this precipitous uh, drop uh, right around, I would say, May of 2011. It turns out that this precipitous drop was uh, uh, very closely correlated to when I bought a Fitbit and started tracking my steps over time, right? And just that knowledge of tracking my steps over time actually caused my weight to go down. Just out of curiosity, how many people here have devices like Fitbits or Jawbones or things like that? It, it, the, what's fascinating to me is actually the, you know, I talk about this stuff relatively frequently. The more, uh, as I've, I've talked about this in recent months, the numbers of people that actually have these devices are going up. So I find this to be sort of reinforcing this thesis. Anyway, that second uh, circle, uh, that second plateau, uh, sort of my new stable you know, uh, state after the Fitbit information was factored into the equation. But then all of a sudden, it started going up again. Turns out that that very closely correlated to when I started lifting weights for the first time in my life. And I actually started putting on some more muscle mass as opposed to you know, whatever other kind of mass I had. Um, <laughs> And then I hit a new plateau, and this is my sort of weightlifter's plateau. And I, you know, I'm not really ripped, but you know what I mean. Uh, but then uh, you hit another sort of strange set of declines uh, in, in the chart. And it turns out that very closely correlates with um, the, when I started this new job at Health and Human Services and stopped being able to eat lunch every day. So I find this interesting, right? But, but it did take some analysis and, and kind of looking back over different data sets to understand exactly what that was about. Now, what this is, is a chart of, um, uh, so my daughter, my first daughter, was born in London a few years ago. Actually, uh, four years ago today. Today's her birthday. And, yeah, it's cute, right? Um, <laughs> we bought her a bike. I didn't put the bike on the thing, but I, sh I probably should have. Anyway, um, so it was a long labor, uh, an 18-hour long labor, um, uh, much less fun for my wife than for me. And, um, but one of the interesting, interesting things was um, that during the process of this labor, uh, this was the fetal ECG that uh, was uh, basically produced by her heart rate during, during this time. Now, my dad is an OBGYN, and I was in London at the time, and so I was literally taking pictures of this thing with my iPhone and emailing it to him so that he could give me a second opinion on what was going on, <laughs> and which, which really pissed off the doctors in London to no end. Um, and it's a much longer story, which I'll tell at some point. But, but um, the point is that... Um, when you look at this chart, right, and think about that particular story, and then look at the chart of my weight over time and think about that, what do they have in common? Well, they have in common that somebody who had knowledge of a certain situation or, you know, sort of other factors had to perform an analysis on that data to reach certain conclusions, right? 
Um, and so I think you know, the, the point there is that this is the world we live in today, right? We're information rich, but we're sort of analysis poor uh, in terms of algorithmic analysis or automated algorithmic analysis. But this world is rapidly changing. Every day we're seeing the introduction of new devices, uh, new services, new algorithms, thanks to you guys, uh, that are allowing us to do uh, more and more of this stuff on our own. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about what exists now. Um, there's a relatively new consumer device called uh, the Basis Watch. Uh, this was released late last year, uh, sort of mid last year. And uh, it's one of the first pieces of uh, consumer equipment that will actually give you proactive suggestions about ways to change your lifestyle. Okay? So I find this fascinating. This watch monitors uh, heart rate patterns, it monitors uh, perspiration, skin temperature. Um, motion sensing like the Fitbits do, um, but it monitors these things constantly, looks for anomalies, and then matches them up against goals. So the example here is, um, you know, they, they, uh, scientific research has shown that if you wake up at a regular time every day, uh, all kinds of good things happen. You know, you, you lose weight, you're, you feel less fatigued, a bunch of stuff. And so the watch, because it monitors your sleep automatically, can actually note that, hey, you're actually not going to bed and waking up at a regular time, you should really try to adjust your lifestyle to do this. And they have a whole bunch of other things like that. Um, now, I wanted to actually include another example of a consumer device that did this proactive analysis and, and uh, monitoring, but I couldn't find one. Uh, you know, it's kind of crazy, but this is really the only thing on the market today for consumers that does this. In the clinical space, however, there are some other things. Um, this, this is actually one of the coolest things I've seen in a long time. So uh, there's a company called Gauss Surgical. It's a relatively small outfit out of California. Um, and what they've done, it, it turns out one of the big problems in surgery is measuring blood loss uh, by patients and then trying to figure out how much blood you have to transfuse back into the patient. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. When you, you know, cut somebody open and blood comes out, it gets collected in a basin or... Uh, it gets soaked up by gauze pads. Usually it gets soaked up by gauze pads, and it's real hard to measure exactly how much comes out, so you gotta you know, figure out how much goes back in. So what these guys did is, and this is so cool, they took an iPad, right, and they mounted it on a surgical pole. And then they take these, they have the doctors take these gauze pads that um, are soaked with blood and pass them in front of the camera on the back of the iPad, which sends the photo up to a server in the cloud that analyzes the image and comes back and tells the doc exactly how much blood was contained in that gauze pad, right? Then thereby telling the people in the operating room how much blood they need to put back into the patient. And then it does actually one other thing, which turns out another problem in surgery is that um, gauze pads are often left behind in patients accidentally. And so it counts the number of gauze pads that you actually take out to make sure that you don't leave any in, which is a good thing. Um, so, so that's an, a great example in the clinical space of uh, devices and these new uh, algorithms that are being used to sort of proactively make suggestions. Uh, another example um, that some of you guys might have heard of is this new smart, uh, smart pill, right? Uh, there's a company called Proteus Health, Proteus Digital Health, and they're the first ones who have uh, gotten FDA approval for a device like this. It's actually very cool. It's a microscopic grain um, element that basically gets baked into a, a pill that when you swallow it, reacts with uh, the acids in your stomach to produce an electrical charge, which is read by that sticker that you stick somewhere on your body. Uh, and what's really cool about this is that uh, you, can, you can think about this in terms of all kinds of stuff. For example, um, medication adherence and compliance is a big, big problem. It's a $200 billion a year problem in this country. Uh, and uh, if, you do, if you bake this technology into some drugs, what you're then able to do is not just remind the individual that they have or have not taken their pills, but you can remind caregivers. You can remind physicians, right? You can remind people who are interested in seeing this person uh, adhere to a regimen in order to make sure that they can do this. So, um, you know, I think this is another great example of a technology that uh, is coming out that will enable uh, caregivers, physicians, patients, et cetera, to take more control over their health. Um, and then um, one other thing I find really interesting is the uh, Qualcomm uh, X Prize for the tricorder development. Have you guys heard about this? Any of you guys, you guys remember Star Trek? You remember the tricorder that, that you know, pass over a body to tell you exactly what's wrong? So uh, the X Prize Foundation has launched this $10 million challenge for somebody to basically develop the first version of the tricorder, a non-invasive device that uh, can capture key health statistics and then diagnose 
uh, 15 different conditions. Uh, and so, you know, this is, um, you know, where we are today, right? We're kind of in the process, like the very tip of the iceberg in terms of getting to this, this state where we're able to take control of our stuff. So they asked me to be a futurist, so I, I have to talk about what's coming. And um, so we're going to go through a, a, a scenario, a little thought experiment. And like any um, good uh, scientist, I'm going to use myself as the subject of this thought experiment. <laughs> My wife told me not to do this, but I'm doing it anyway. So, um, so, so let's imagine the following scenario. Um, I wake up one morning. You know, I've got my, my watch strapped to my wrist or some other device that monitors my sleep patterns. Uh, and I sort of groggily stumble into the bathroom and look into the mirror. Now, it's, it's weird. I feel really tired. I don't know why. I mean, I went to bed at uh, 1 in the morning, which is a little late. But I woke up at 9, and so I got, I got some good sleep. Well, it turns out that uh, I only got two hours of REM sleep. My smart mirror is telling me this because it's able to interact with all the devices that I currently have. And so that's interesting, and I wonder why. And then all of a sudden, the uh, picture of my gut microbiome that's generated by my smart toilet comes up and reminds me <laughs> that I probably shouldn't have had all that beer last night. Oh, and by the way, that late night jumbo slice that I also had was a terrible idea. Um, and so you know, I'm, I'm starting to understand now why uh, I feel so bad this morning. Um, made even worse by, uh, it turns out, so recent behavioral science research shows that uh, you're able to meet your goals much more effectively if a loved one or a family member, um, particularly your mother, is reminding you to kind of do things. And so as part of, you know, as following the science, I decided to share my real-time data with my mother. Well, my mother um, <laughs> woke up earlier than me and saw my data feed and recorded a video telling me how disappointed she was. That's actually really my mother. Um, <laughs> And that's a frequent look, I, I should say. Um, so now in order to pay penance uh, for this, um, you know, I ha everything in my house is connected. And my fridge actually happens to know what I have in it. And so my fridge makes a suggestion to me for breakfast, which is that I should have a couple of scrambled egg whites, maybe a dry English muffin, and one of those bananas that I have sitting down. But also, um, I should probably bike to work today because it's a beautiful day and you, know, you consumed a lot of calories last night, so it's probably a good idea to kind of work some of this up. So fine, you know, all, all good. You know, I'm starting to feel a little bit better and go downstairs, whip up some eggs, eat them, hop on my bike and go to work. And um, you know, I'm riding down Connecticut Avenue and there's a bunch of traffic, so I decide to hop up onto the sidewalk in order to get around it and I hit the curb and I fall. Uh, which has happened, um, but, um, and, and actually now my wrist really hurts because I broke my fall with my wrist. Luckily, I have the next gen tricorder built into my phone, so I pass it over my wrist, right? And uh, what it tells me is that I actually have a hairline fracture now of um, one of my bones. Okay, so, so far not such a great day, but luckily there's a minute clinic a couple of blocks away. So I pick up my bike, I kind of limp over to the minute clinic, Oh, and by the way, I've also sent that, tri that tricorder scan over to this minute clinic. And when I get there, I have a 3D printed cast that fits my wrist geometry perfectly, ready to go. I snap it on, I take a couple of um, prescribed pain meds, and I'm good to go. And so that, to me, is one vision of how all of this data being integrated into a scenario uh, can actually help us take more control and be healthier uh, and be more active in our personal health. What's really interesting to me uh, about this scenario is that not once during any one of these events did I actually interact with a trained physician. Um, that actually is my dad, uh, who is a trained physician. Um, now, he's an OBGYN, so I probably wouldn't have interacted with him anyway. And, and I, I would point out that um, his profession is probably a little safer because nobody really wants babies to be caught by machines, just a guess. But, but think about it from a primary care physician perspective, right? Everything that, that happened to me in the course of that morning um, were potentially things that primary care physicians would have been involved in on a regular basis. But, you know, the future is very, very close to happening where a lot of this stuff is... Uh, possible to be algorithmically generated and uh, um, integrated into our daily lives in such a way that we can actually uh, uh, go forward and, and own our own health in a much better way. So uh, I was asked, I was given 12 minutes, I've taken 12 minutes and 43 seconds, so I'm not going to go into the philosophical question of what happens to doctors, we'll leave that for later. 
Um, but um, you know, this is something uh, to think about and something to ponder as it comes to uh, the four. So thank you guys very much. I appreciate it. So now we're going to turn it over, Oops. And turn it over to Jen, who will um, ask us a few questions uh, based on what we've heard. And then we'll spend about 10 minutes doing that and about 10 minutes opening it up to questions from the audience. Jen. Great. Uh, so I'm not going to get up at the podium. I'll start by apologizing for my constant coughing. You all should feel bad. I picked this cold up in Paris. Uh, so <laughs> I was really <laughs> suffering. Uh, so yeah, my job is to give these guys a hard time, uh, basically. But I, I thought I'd just sort of preface a little bit. Uh, so I'm a computer scientist by training, which means I don't care that much about people, and I love data. Um, <laughs> but I've sort of shifted over, and I care a lot about people now. Uh, and in fact, I study social networks. Uh, when I started studying social networks, I would go give talks. This was like 2003, 2004, and the computer scientists would say, this is really social science, right? This isn't computer science because it's people sharing all this data. And now they're all my friends, right? <laughs> uh, so so be, we've come to see that this data that people are sharing in social media, uh, on the web, all of these things these guys are talking about is really important, really useful, and has lots of interesting computational challenges along with the ethical challenges, policy challenges, and things like that. So this is something that's um, really personal to me. And when I go give talks about my work, um, I, I like to start with a slide that says, we know who you are and what you're doing. Uh, and that's true, and, and all of these guys have sort of hinted at it, that there's a lot of research out there, and, and this is really where I focus my work, that can predict what you're going to do, what your personal attributes are, and how you relate to other people by leveraging all this data we have in social media, analyzing it, and applying it. So we really can figure out a lot about people. And there's a great study that recently came out in the Proceedings of the National Academies. Um, and I did a lot of press on it, not because I did the study, but because it's similar to work that I've done. And I was the outside expert who could comment on the study. Um, and these researchers at Cambridge showed that by analyzing your likes on Facebook, they could predict your gender, your race, your intelligence, your personality traits, whether or not you smoked, used alcohol, used illegal drugs, with some accuracy, whether or not your parents had separated before you were 12 years old. Uh, tons of really interesting insights just by looking at the likes that you have on Facebook, no other information. Uh, and so I went in and I did a bunch of NPR interviews on this call-in shows and uh, people would call in and they'd say, I'm not embarrassed by the things that I'm putting on my Facebook profile, like I put it up there, I'm fine with people seeing that and if they don't like the real me then that's their problem. And, and so that's all fine, but, but I think a lot of these people were missing the point that we can find out all sorts of things that you're not explicitly sharing, right? And that's a problem that I see everywhere when I go talk about my work, that, that it's really hard for people to truly understand the power that we have with this big data and the things that we can find out that people aren't intentionally sharing. And, and that can have a lot of far-reaching implications. So part of what I'm going to harass you guys about when I get to questions is how we get people to really understand that. <coughs> um, but, I, but I think there's one other preface I want to have before I jump into the questions, and that's that the part of this issue with big data, and a lot of it does come from people, uh, is that there's two components of this. One is that I'm contributing data, and the other is maybe that I'm benefiting from that data. Uh, so the traffic example that Victor gave is great, right? I'm, I'm benefiting from getting traffic information. I'm also contributing data. And we can think of it kind of like taxes there, right? You know, I pay the taxes, but whether I like it or not, I'm benefiting from the things that those taxes are paying from. Uh, but that's not always true. Sometimes we're not getting the benefit back. Um, so Dan, I know this probably isn't your fault, but Google's got this thing that they do um, that they have been doing for a while. And, and Ben Peters and I have talked about this, where uh, you, can, you start typing in a search, and you type one letter, and you instantly have the search results that come up for that letter, and you type the second letter. I want to murder people when this happens. Like There is nothing that enrages me more in my user experience than when Google starts showing me results as I'm typing. I just want to type the word and then get the results for that. Now I can disable it, and it's disabled, and I forget that it exists until I borrow somebody else's computer and it's turned on, and it just drives me crazy. So this is a big data issue, right, Google, and I'm sure they're giving good results there, but my personal experience is that I don't want to participate, I don't want the benefits, and I kind of don't want to contribute, I would like it to die, right? <laughs> uh, 
And, and their systems, I, I get this a lot also. I'm a woman in my mid-30s, and so everybody assumes that I'm having babies, um, which I'm not, and I have <laughs> no intentions to have any babies. But I get an awful lot of diaper ads and uh, starting to get the IVF ads because you don't have a baby yet, and so maybe we can help you with that. <coughs> Now, some of those things are useful. So I love the Google ads. I, I am occasionally inspired to buy expensive shoes. And uh, uh, Google ads are a great thing for that because I can just type in the brand name, and the best results are the Google ads for the stores that sell that, sell that brand. But, but there's a, a trade-off here. And, and there's an increasingly famous story coming out of some of this big data analysis, the same kind of thing that targets me for IVF and diaper ads, um, started sending coupons, physical coupons, by mail to this teenage girl girl at home for diapers and baby supplies. And her father called enraged, how dare you send my teenage daughter you know, these ads? She's not pregnant. She's not having sex. I can't believe you do this. And it turns out the girl's like, actually, dad, I am pregnant, <laughs> right? So the company found out and started marketing to her before she told her parents about her pregnancy. Um, so these are just some of these things that we have to keep in mind when we're talking about this big data, that, that there are benefits. Uh, there are absolutely benefits that people get from big data being used. Um, but some of them aren't beneficial. Some of them can cause real problems. And some of them just can cause real irritation, and people want to opt out of that benefit. So those are some thoughts to have in mind as I start asking you guys the hard questions on page one. Um, <laughs> so Brian, I'm going to start with you just because I really loved all the stuff you talked about, and it's not too scary because it's personal. <laughs> but uh, I mean, I love my Fitbit. I'm kind of obsessed with my Fitbit, and I love this personal data. Um, but the, and and you weren't talking a lot about um, it, these interactive systems or people targeting and doing things for me. Uh, but there's great potential with oh, that. Yeah. So my question for you is, who should own <laughs> this data? Because in the U.S. I don't own most of right. that data, so there's your question. Yeah, I mean, from, from my perspective, uh, and actually the perspective of uh, <laughs> the department, um, the data that uh, you generate is your data, right? Uh, and, and when it comes to uh, a lot of these systems, Fitbit, uh, Jawbone, uh, even Nike's fuel band to a certain extent, and other uh, consumer devices that are out there, if you look at their terms of service very closely, you actually you do have access to it, but not in every possible way that you would want. Um, there's a, uh, a, a, a guy that um, we've been working with at, at the National Institutes of Health who actually happens to be a quantified self-geek on the side of being a cancer researcher, uh, who actually uh, decided that he wanted to write an application for himself, he's a hacker, uh, to actually take his personal data off of these different services and create some new analysis of it. And so he did. And um, his account was promptly shut down by a lot of these services because he violated their terms of service, like <coughs> exporting data, uh, which we think in general is a really bad idea. Uh, one of the things that uh, I'm actually working on is trying to get all of these folks together. Government's really good at convening. That's one thing we're really, really good at. <laughs> and so uh, what I'd like to do is convene all of the players in this uh, ecosystem uh, to try to convince them that, again, we're, at, we're sort of at the precipice of being able to do really interesting things, but we're only going to be able to do really interesting things if that data is exportable and shareable and, uh, and essentially consumable by the individual themselves and by other applications that, that they give authority to. Great. Uh, so, Dan, I'm not going to give you too much of a hard time, um, at least about the Google stuff. Uh, <laughs> but, but so here's, here's my question for you that that gets to a kind of bigger issue with this and that touches on something you said in your talk. Um, you talked about storytelling and how that's a really important part of big data. Um, and so my question for you is an interface one. Uh, the user is something that often gets lost, right? Because we can talk about things that companies can do, the big places can do with the big data. Uh, but we don't talk a lot about what the individual user can do with access to big pieces of data. Now, you kind of got to this in your talk um, and that these stories are important. But my question for you is if you can give us some thoughts on how users can potentially be manipulated by the tools that they're given to tell these stories, or if you think that that's a, an easy problem to overcome. So the tools of <coughs> big data storytelling are things like visualization, but also analytic tools. So you can go in, for example, and extract some sequence of behaviors or find some filtered data that particularly you know, uh, helps you out. Um, and as I was trying to imply, one of the things about um, analysis is that it's not obvious often how to do it. And so one of the, it's a, it requires a little bit of skill. Analysis has always required skill, but now it's like big skill. Mm -hmm. um, 
But one of the things I find really encouraging is that one of the really nice things about a lot of these tools is that you can take that data that's publicly available, analyze it, come up with a visualization or some rendering of the story, say using uh, the Google uh, graphing tools, or there's a lot of public source things out there like that, say D3, for example. Um, and you can actually visualize these things. And then, and then if you've done it right, you can go back to the data and you can actually have a discussion about it. So for, I'll, I'll, my favorite story about this was we had a, a PhD candidate come in. And you know what it's like. Candidates work for years on their thesis. They come in, and the first line out of this person's mouth was, my, all my content and my data is up on my website. The guy next to me instantly connects to the website and downloads the data set. He's describing his thesis work, which has taken him four <laughs> years of developing this algorithm. He's describing the algorithm. And my buddy is in MATLAB reproducing the algorithm. And as he's going through, and he says, well, here's my result. <coughs> right, my result is x, y, z. Compute. Hmm. Not the same. OK? Now, my friend is a good friend. He's a good guy. So he says, you know, I have a slightly different outcome than you do. Let's talk about why. Okay? He wasn't saying, you bonehead, you screwed up. He said, let's talk about why our analysis is different. Because I tried to reproduce your method. This is science in the instant. This is not science waiting six months to get publication approval and six months to get it through a journal, maybe, if you're lucky, and then you know, for it to get out in publication. This is science in the same day. Okay? So that's one of the things I like about the new sort of cloud-based style of doing this kind of thing is because it is accessible and it is possible. And I think that's an interesting, lovely trend in science. To, you know, if you publish a paper and you've got a bunch of open source required data, you had better provide a link to it so that the conversation can continue and it continue much more quickly. <coughs> this is the acceleration of science, I think, in some, some really meaningful and interesting way. Great. That ended up in a different place than I thought it would, but it was interesting. So <laughs> give me credit for that. It is a different story than you thought I would tell. That's, that's right. That's OK, though. That's OK. Um, uh, so, so Victor, this actually isn't a hard time giving you a hard time question for you. Well, um, you like Victor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, you you got so I had made some notes coming in on, on things I thought that I might talk about. And this issue of of contributing and gaining benefit and whether or not we think of big data as something that has a tax model or not. Um, you actually talked about a lot of things that reflected that in your talk. So I thought maybe you could just give us some thoughts on this idea of um, users contributing, whether or not they should opt in or have to opt out of that, um, what benefits they're deriving, and if that's something they should opt in or out of, and, and what you kind of see as the models going forward for that. Thank you very much for that uh, lowball question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so you, um, you set me up to, um, to basically be, uh, it's impossible to fail that question, but I'll try hard. <laughs> um, and, and here is why. Because uh, one of the things that I, I, I didn't uh, address in my talk was the privacy dimension of things. Um, I, I wanted to highlight the uh, probabilistic propensity dimension more so than the privacy dimension because uh, it's, it's novel, it's new, it's something that, we, that I was surprised by. But when we think about how we, coming out of the small data age, we think we protect our privacy, um, we must understand that this will not work in the big data age anymore. The way we protect privacy right now is through a system of notice and consent. That is, we assume that we are giving notices, and then people make an informed decision about whether they consent or not. Of course, that's all bullshit. Because, pardon my French here, you get a 20-page document. You automatically click accept because you want the service. So that's the informed consent, and that's the notice. And then you get the service. You have no choice in reality if you want a particular service, and you don't read the notice. So this is a very formalistic process of, us, of protecting our privacy. It's not protecting anything. It's just going through the hoops. Moreover, if we take this seriously in the big data age, we can't repurpose information. So take Google and Google's flu trends. They use search terms that people send to Google to get search results in order to model the spread of the flu almost in real time. It's incredibly valuable for public health officials. Now, if we take notice and consent seriously, we would have 
to go back to all of the billion of people and ask them to reconsent to that particular purpose of use. That's ridiculous. Notice and consent is a small data mechanism that just doesn't work anymore. Now, that doesn't mean that in the big data age we don't have any privacy. That means we need a different mechanism by which we protect our privacy. In the small data age, when we had 30 or 20 or 50 data points about us floating around, our social security number, our passport number, our date of birth, and so forth, we could try to protect each one of them. If we have billions of them floating around, it's impossible to protect them. So what I am convinced is we need a restart of privacy mechanisms that need to be focused on responsibility and accountability of the data user rather than relying on notice and consent. Can I, can I actually give one interesting example, I think, of that? So uh, have you guys heard of the Thousand Genomes Project? Yes. OK, so 1,000 people donated their DNA, essentially, to this project. Uh, and in doing so, gave uh, three, or they, along with their genome, was released three pieces of personally <laughs> identifiable information, birthday, gender, and zip code. And that's it. Uh, so earlier this week, uh, or maybe it was last week, a Harvard researcher published a, a story, mm -hmm. uh, or a, a study, about uh, her ability to essentially uh, re-identify over half of the participants in this, uh, in this project. By name. Latanya. Yeah, yeah. by name, right. by name. Um, simply by using those three pieces of data. And also, as an interesting uh, side project to this, put up a website where you can go and type in those three pieces of data yourself and see how many people in your zip code uh, have the same gender and birthday. So how many people do you think, so I tried it, how many people do you think had uh, my same birthday uh, and gender in 2008, where I live? Two, one, me, right? That's it. So I mean, I mean you're talking, you, know, you talk about, I, I think you're exactly right, and, and I think this is a perfect proof point. Uh, because we have given this data out. I, I actually kind of think we live in a world where privacy is almost dead for this reason. We've already released enough information that we have to assume that people are going to be able to not only compute, but also impute right, yeah. ideas and behaviors. And so this is a tricky one. And it, and it gets to that idea of people not understanding what the value of the data is right. that they're sharing, yeah. right? Because you, I could say I'm going to give you my gender, my birthday, and my zip code and think I'm not giving you anything. Anything at all. I'm right. giving you everything. Right. 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 I mean, that's actually a great, great segue into the next segment here, which is um, we're going to open up the questions from the audience. And do we want to start with the internet question first? Yes. And while we hand the mic to Tanya, I'll, I'll add to that by um, we actually had a, a piece of feedback from one of our Google users who said that she had searched for her social security number and found it. Would you please remove it? It was a reduction, it was a removal request. Um, and we had to write back and say, look, I'm really sorry, but your digits are in the expansion of pi. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there's actually nothing we can do about it. <laughs> anyway, Tanya, you have a question uh, off the internet. What, uh, what is it? This is a question from email um, that was emailed to us by uh, Ivan Golub, who's in computer science at the University of Maryland. And it's a kind of a poetic question that has um, to do with <coughs> privacy. So here's the question. By the end of the Robert Heinlein novel, The Puppet Masters, everyone on the planet had to walk around naked to prove that they were not hiding the fact that they had a mind-controlling parasite on them or risk arrest. As big data is being discussed more and more in terms of finding suspects in criminal investigations, which Victor talked about, uh, will someone who avoids technology that can be used to track them risk being marked instantly as a potential suspect in the future? either by authorities or by other citizens, just by refusing to be surveyed. Sure. I, I, <laughs> it's, um, I want to tell a tiny little story about that. And the tiny little story has to do with a Google service called Google Street View. And you're familiar with Google Street View. Now, in Germany, Google Street View was highly controversial. And there was a question of whether it's an opt-in or opt-out and so forth and so on. And the German government and the data protection authorities uh, negotiated with Google. And Google was then uh, willing to put up um, a, a web page where people could request that their houses uh, would be obfuscated on Google Street View, uh, that they could essentially opt out of Google, Google Street View. Now, um, 
couple of hundred thousand did, uh, and Google uh, did what they had promised. When you now go through a German village, in Bavaria, for example, which was one of the first villages that went up on Street View, and you go down the street, you, know, you see the beautiful houses. But then, of course, you also come across something else. People in Bavarian villages were worried that their house was in Google Street View because the newspapers printed stories about Google Street View being used by Eastern European criminals to identify houses to break in, sort of targets, because you could sort of peek over the hedge and, and all that. So a lot of people who had valuable stuff at home opted out, <laughs> which is the perfect signal for the criminals to go in and ransack the house. The problem in our world is you cannot not communicate. And that's the point that <laughs> I think that's. That, that, that's a lovely story. <laughs> Let, let's take the next question. And then and over you, Alice. Dan, um, when you were showing visualizations of data, um, it reminded me that I could not create a logarithmic display. I never was good at that. And it brings me to the question of whether we're now going from a digital divide to an analytical divide. Mm. And if analysis is going to be one of the key functional issues, what about all the people who aren't good at it? Or re reverse it, what does that mean about the education we have to do to overcome those barriers, and isn't it going to be something more than just, okay, you're not good at math, but there are other tools and other tool sets of analysis. We've got to think about the different ways people understand things in figuring that one out. It, it's an excellent point, and you, you've actually touched on something that I'm really interested in, because I teach a lot of people how to be better Google searchers, and so there are many divides, and in fact, I think divides will always be with us. And uh, unfortunately, the entire world is not composed of New Hampshire farmers who vote democratically, right? <laughs> uh, the world is an extremely variegated place. And the level of skill that people have, I think, as a consequence of information technology and big data and a lot of other things, including tool use um, in general, um, makes the world uneven. And this is an inherent property of technology, you know, right from stone axes those who could versus those who couldn't, the initial digital divide, right? Um, and so in particular, as we grow ever more powerful tools, I mean, one thing that's interesting about the new generation of power tools, you can have one. You can use it, right? 100 years ago, a power tool meant you needed a 100-ton hydraulic press. You could not have one. Now the world is different. So in some sense, the new technology, the new power tools are much more egalitarian because you can learn, believe me, in 10 minutes, I can show you how to do a log scale, right? Um, and more besides. And so a large part of my online education efforts are how to help people become better searchers, for example. Because I can show you how to do searches that would knock your socks off and allow you to find uh, houses, say, in Bavaria. No, no, better example. <laughs> um, but, uh, but things that you would not believe are possible. And I think this really kind of gets to the whole privacy issues that we've been discussing. Because often it's not just a question of opting in, it's a question of, like the Facebook example Jen pointed to, of providing information you don't believe could be inferred upon in that way, and yet it can. So I think the divides are always with us, but we actually live in a better, more even level technology space than we have before. So let's go over here to Allison. Yes. Um, I'm Sahar Kamis, uh, Assistant Professor in the Department of Communication at the University of Maryland. A lot of my work has focused on the uh, revolutions that have been sweeping the Arab world yeah. and definitely big data, you know, big communication through social media networks, you know, Twitter and, and uh, you know, uh, Facebook and uh, YouTube has had a big impact. I want to ask you, you know, all of you about the uh, implications, the big data implications on big 
social and political movements and what could be the possible implications on you know, both activists who want to use these types of media and these types of tools, as well as dictators and oppressors and you know, uh, really people there who want to oppress or suppress some of these movements and sabotage them, because both of them are now brilliantly using you know, the media for all of these different purposes. So what are the big data implications on big mobilization and big socio-political movements? Thank you. Okay. Um, actually, can I also, uh, Jenner, are you interested in answering this question too? Yeah, I can jump in on okay. that. Okay. Um, let me do a quick time check. How much time do we have? Three minutes. Oh, okay. oh no, we have we have another five to ten. Don't worry. <laughs> okay, we can I'll each take brief. one minute to answer. Jen, yeah. you begin. Um, this is a really interesting question, especially as um, s social media providers in particular are making interfaces more available for doing some of the kinds of scary-ish analysis we're talking about. So Facebook, for example, now has this graph search that you can go in and do. Um, and Slate had this brilliant article a couple, uh, couple months ago, I think, right when it became available in beta, where they were saying, uh, look, here's a search that I ran. I'm interested. Show me all the people who live in my city who are female, age 18 to 24, who like the page, I love getting drunk. He found a very specific kind of girl, right? Uh, with that search. They also did a search looking, I think, um, show me all of the men in Tehran who work for this company who have said that they're interested in dating other men. Uh, now, on one hand, they're putting that data out there on Facebook. On the other hand, the search of give me a list of everybody who meets these demographic profiles is kind of scary. Now, if we add on to that the ability um, to predict things, so I mentioned that study from the proceedings of the National Academies, they're predicting all sorts of traits. Um, we've shown that you can select, successfully predict political preference quite clearly. Um, and these aren't from obvious things. One of the highest indicators of intelligence on their test was liking the page for curly fries. Um, <laughs> One of the indicators of low intelligence, and I will say this is not my research, was if you like the page, I love being a mom. I love being a mom showed up for low intelligence. Now that's, that's not because motherhood indicates low intelligence. It's because, my guess, that page was probably started by someone who scored lower on that page, who is friends with people like her. Right? This is a basic premise of social connection, that you're friends with people who are like you. And so you know, she probably had a lower score. She started that page. Some of her friends probably also had lower scores. And so you just ended up with that page having people with lower intelligence levels. For potential political oppression, you could have completely innocuous pages right, for a food that you like. But if it's started by someone who's active in a movement, their friends probably are too. And that could bring in people who are identifiable as being part of that movement, not because of anything explicit, but because with the huge amounts of data, we're able to predict it. Um, so I think that this is going to be a real challenge, both in getting people to understand the sorts of things that are visible about them when it's public, even if there's nothing explicit there, uh, but then also regulating how people are able to access that data. So I don't have a good solution, but, but I see that there's actually a bunch more steps in the implications that can come from this. Thank you. Brian, comment? Yeah, so um, I, I mean, I think what happens is that these networks start to move underground. Um, you know, you have, uh, and when, you, when you look at the Arab Spring, you had people tweeting and using Facebook as uh, organization and communication networks. Um, but uh, as a result of some of the oppression that was brought on those networks after uh, people posted and organized and gathered, uh, you're starting to see technologies develop that allow that kind of stuff to go underground. So, for example, um, you'll see uh, little plugs that are actually fully featured connected servers that can simply be plugged into walls to create local mesh networks where people can connect and network uh, without fear of being located or, or, uh, or caught. Um, I saw a company that just the other day that's developing a new device where you literally plug it into the headset jack of your uh, phone and it creates a, uh, a, a network on the 2.4 gigahertz frequency uh, that can reach a mile in any direction, right? So think about that. I mean, if everybody has one of those, and this is, they're prototyping it right now, but it works. So if everybody, and they're cheap, right? You can buy them for 15 bucks. So if everybody has one of those and they plug it into their, their phones, all of a sudden you've got a network that's theoretically, you know, it's encrypted, it's theoretically untraceable. And so I, you know, I, I, I can kind of see these things going more underground than, than above ground until such time as they've gained enough steam that it's impossible to sort of you know, take it out by uh, focusing on the, the above ground part of it. So 
That's the, I think that's probably where it's going to go. I've spoken enough, so I'll okay. take a pass. Okay, great. Um, I'll, I'll just uh, actually build a little bit on what Brian said and say uh, that uh, uh, during part of the Arab Spring, what, one of the things that happens in, in some places like Syria just recently, they turned off the internet, um, Egypt turned off the internet and so on. Um, uh, an engineer in, in Google created a, a speak to tweet function. So you can't really turn off the phones. I mean, you can, but it's really disastrous for the whole economy. Uh, and so what, one of the things I like about your story is that there are a lot of technological workarounds. And one of the things about having um, widely disseminated uh, tools and mechanisms like this, like the ones he described or ones like the Google engineer built, is that they do have these end runarounds. And you can't shut off the electricity and the phones and the internet to a country without devastating the country. Uh, people may choose to do that, but consequences follow after that. So I, I'm actually um, an optimist about a lot of this stuff, particularly because of the dissemination. That a lot of, there are a lot of kids in particular who are extremely talented, and I think they're really the hope for a lot of this in the future. Can we do one more? Sure. Oh, let Okay, last question <laughs> to Pat O'Shea. Yeah, I've got a question about right. predicting the future as opposed to post-dicting, which is you know, just predicting things that have already right. happened or right. uncovering things. I mean, in, in physics, we've got a principle called the, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which says if you attempt to measure something, you automatically change it. So there are certain kinds of phenomena, if you predict them because of the actions people will take based on the prediction, it, they will change the future. Right. So it's... The weather is not an example of that, but the stock market is. So what are people doing about that, about the analysis of, like, is it actually possible to predict the stock market? Because as soon as you predict it and act on that prediction, it actually changes the future. So I have a quick comment about that. Um, I, I know about boxes and cats. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's all the same thing, actually. Um, but that's what exactly what the Google Flu Trends does. Right. It, it, it actually ha has a very, it develops a model as the, as the year goes along and finds these high value signals and basically is trying to create a prediction. We, we're in the prediction business a lot. So for example, we do a lot of internal prediction of you know, what kind of server loads will we require and so on. And there's, we have very, fairly well worked out models year to year, week to week, season to season and so on. So building models like that are incredibly useful. So I think we can do that sort of thing. I don't know that we can do it for the stock market I think that's classically improvable. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. yeah you act on it, and it changes. That's right. That's right. And we saw an example of that with the uh, hacked AP Twitter account, where the stock market was doing just fine until somebody intervened by posting that there was an explosion at the White House. So the market reacted negatively to that, but self self corrected fairly quickly. So I think there's a lot of interesting uh, modeling technology that can be brought to bear here, and if anything, our models are getting better and better. Right. So. Any other comments from this, yeah. folks? Do we have time for an internet question? Or no? Sure. It's up to you. <laughs> it's your time. Here you go. A quick one. Okay. We'll get a quick answer. It's a quick question, and it's a technical question from Heather Dean of the National Science Foundation. So her question is, how can science, which often collects data in very different formats, even within one field, best standardize data in order to effectively share it? And if we do try to standardize data, do we lose diversity in oh. points of view? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'd like to uh, volunteer a counterintuitive answer, and that is um, thinking about, I, I understand where she's coming from, and I appreciate that, but it's also a, a small data age kind of thinking in the sense that um, in the small data age, because we had a limited number of data points, we standardized, we curated them, we made sure that they were absolutely exact and, 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 and right on. Um, the big data age is going to be characterized, as Dan said earlier, by messiness. By messiness of data sets, by messiness of the analysis, because we're combining different data sources of different provenance, different quality, and so forth. So we won't be able to predict down to the last penny, the last inch, the last atom. We get more directional answers, but in many cases, that's good enough. Very good. Okay, I'm going to turn the floor back to Ira and Allison. Thank you, panel. <laughs> Thank you. That was tremendous. Um, 
Thank you to Dan Russell, who moderated our Futurist in Residence. Thank you to Victor, to Brian, to Jen, all get contributing a wealth of big data to our discussion on big data. And, uh, and, and to our, uh, to obviously Pat O'Shea and to Governor O'Malley who opened, who opened the floor with remarks. Oh, and thank, I, one more thing. And thanks to all of you for coming here um, to really to think about this together with us. To thank you uh, to the people that are, uh, are on the live stream as well. Um, it is without, com without conversations like this that we don't begin to make change for the future. So we invite you 